Good morning, everyone. The theme of this service is spiritual practice. And I know we take that all very seriously and try to have spiritual practice as a part of our life. What we'd like to do with this first piece is give you some suggestions on how you may incorporate some very nice techniques. On the first day of practice, my guru gave to me the grounding root of a tree. On the second day of practice, my guru gave to me two things of bells and the grounding root of a tree. On the third day of practice, my guru gave to me three quartz crystals, two things of bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the fourth day of practice, my guru gave to me meditation music, Three quartz crystals, two zinc bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the fifth day of practice, my guru gave to me five singing bowls, meditation music, three quartz crystals, two zinc bells, and the ground. Chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three quartz crystals, two tincture bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the eighth day of practice, my guru gave to me eight pendulums. Seven chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three quartz crystals, two tincture bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the ninth day of practice, my guru gave to me nine tarot cards. Eight pendulums, seven chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three quartz crystals, two tincture bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the tenth day of practice, my guru gave to me Ten salt lamps, nine tarot decks, eight pendulums, seven chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three quartz crystals, two tincture bells, and the grounding root of a tree. Day of practice, my guru gave to me eleven yoga classes, ten salt lamps, nine tarot decks, eight pendulums, seven chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three chords, crystals, two. Bells, and the grounding root of a tree. On the twelfth day of practice, my guru gave to me twelve sage marsh sticks, eleven yoga classes, ten salt lamps, nine tarot.
Eight pendulums, seven chakra clearings, six prayer candles, five singing bowls, meditation music, three chords, crystals, two tincture bells, and the grounding root of a tree. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. I was so relieved when I turned around and saw some of you smiling and some of you chuckling. I thought, do they think they have to memorize this? They were so serious and quiet. But I'm glad that um, many of you enjoyed that. And thank you, Chris, for putting it together. So welcome. I'm Reverend Karen Brammer. Always honored, always amazed that I have the privilege, the honor and the joy of being the minister here with you at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Utica. I am wanting to make sure that you know, in case you have forgotten or you've never heard it before, but everyone who walks in these doors is welcome. No matter what your background has been, no matter where you are going forward into, no matter what your faith formation has been or lack thereof, whatever you understand to be your sexuality, your race, your ethnicity, all are welcome here. And we are also very mindful that we live in a culture that um, um, does not honor, to say the least, does not honor all of our differences. And so we're very intentional about remembering that we are on the land of the Haudenosaunee, that we are on the land of the people of Oneida, who actually live just 30 miles from us, but who were removed forcibly from this land and we continue to try to figure out what it means to be in relationship covenantal relationship with people who experience the marginalization and the oppression of our culture and many of us are affected by those things and so we're mindful of that and come with a spirit of hope and commitment and joy to this space. So welcome indeed. And Jeff is gonna help us with announcements. Okay, good morning, I'm Jeff Chard. And we want you to know that there's a brief inclusion meeting. Uh, so it's right here in this front area by the chalice in chairs. Grab your coffee and your snack and uh, join Steph and the inclusion team, please, for that meeting uh, during the coffee hour. Midway through the coffee hour, Reverend Karen is going to uh, have a discussion about this service and about uh, spiritual practices. So you're welcome to join Reverend Karen. Um, we need volunteers for the picnic. There's a big white page on that door to the storage closet. And uh, that's for signups. Please sign up for food or to be on the crew or to do anything you want. Um, our wandering monk, Brian Lottman, is going to be here August 1st. That's next week, but we're not going to see you this past this uh, coming Sunday, unless you're up at uh, Salisbury, right? But let me tell you about Brian Lottman first, August 1st, 7 p.m. It'll be in the newsletter. Um, I looked at, he offered to speak here, and I looked at his videos online and he brought me joy. So I said, everybody should have this opportunity to experience joy. So please come and see Brian at 7 p.m. on Thursday, August 1st. Uh, the church picnic I talked about. Um, Salisbury Center uh, has outdone themselves this year in time changes for next week's service. It is now at 11 a.m. <laughs> so uh, carpooling still, yes, Ken Drake from our parking lot at 10.
Speak to Ken if you're interested in driving or riding carpool from our parking lot at 10 a.m. for Sunday service at Salisbury Center. You, you, Utica, 10 Higby Road will not be open next Sunday. We're all going to Salisbury, 40 minutes away. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if you're new or recent here, and you're not getting the newsletter and you would like to have it emailed to you every week and if you just like to know a little bit us to know a little bit about you there are forms under the clock on the back wall you can write things in where the slots are and all kinds of good things will happen to you jeff don't forget me i wasn't gonna oh i was okay. gonna say and now <laughs> We need coffee people, coffee hour people for August 4, please. Thank you, Mary. So nobody signed up. We got to have coffee. That's like, you know, they have wine in some churches. We have coffee. Uh, <laughs> you got to sign up somebody, please. You know where the sign up sheet is, right? Right out in the hallway. Okay. I have some sheets. I hope you will want some sheets. They're two sided. Some time ago, a few members asked the climate team if we would research all those advertisements for solar energy that you're getting. Well, we did research them, and we came out with a, a recommendation, which is on this sheet. There is a web page for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Utica. It's called UUCU. Look at that. And this page tells how. Um, so see me afterwards, or I'll put the sheets back on that lectern by the under the clock. How about that? Look at that. Please take one per family because you probably don't need two in one family. Trying to save paper. Trying to Any, save paper. And budget. Anything else? Anything else? Going, going, gone. Actually quite present. <sighs> Welcome. Would anybody like to volunteer to light our chalice this morning? Anybody like to light the chalice this morning? Please go ahead, Glenn. Oh, Branwyn. These words come from the Haggadah, a Passover Haggadah. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you spirit of freedom. If you remember, join with me in the affirmation that's multi-general, multi-generational. Oh, it could be an interesting service. My mouth and my brain are creatively connected today. So this is the church. Oh, we are Unitarian Universalist. This is the church of the opened mind, the loving heart, and the helping hands. We take care of the planet and one another. May that be so. Here are words from Adrian Rich to bring us to center. No one ever told us we had to study our lives, make of our lives a study as if learning natural history or music, that we should begin with a simple exercise first, and slowly go on trying the hard one, practicing, practicing till strength and accuracy became one with the daring to leap into transcendence. And in fact, we can't live like that. We take on everything all at once before we've gotten even to learn how to read or mark time. We've been forced to begin in the midst of the hardest moment, the one already sounding as we are born. In the blue hymn book is a, a song called Standing on the Side of Love. Many Unitarian Universalists being mindful of differences in our abilities, love to sing living on the side of love, but sing in whatever 
way feels right to you. And so turn to 1014. If you would like to stand, please do, but rise in spirit as you sing 1014, Standing on the Side of Love. heard that piece at General Assembly. There were 10,000 Unitarian Universalists singing that song together, and boy, it's almost believable that we are standing and we are living on the side of love. So for our time together, I want to um, invite all of us, as we think about the things we can do to help ourselves come back to a place where we feel like we belong, where we're in our bodies, where we value ourselves, that there is a very simple thing that Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Buddhist monk, was until his recent death, a, British, uh, a Buddhist monk, who taught walking meditation. And if you'd like, you're welcome to get up and do this um, or just feel your feet on the ground. But what he says is that all walking meditation is, is putting one foot in front of the other, first the, the heel and then the toe, your other foot joins you. And then before you go any further, you say to yourself, I'm here. And the next foot, the heel and your toes and bring the other one to join. And you can say, I belong to this beautiful earth. It helps us drop out of the tensions. It helps us to come back into our bodies, to the body of the planet. And so I know a lot of children nowadays are learning a skill that many of us did not learn, which is, oh, the word for it left me, moderating, um, it's self-regulation, it's recognizing what's happening to us and having a skill or two, yes, some younger people are shaking their heads. Self-regulation because the pandemic was so hard on so many. To self-regulate means you go, oh, here I am, and I want to be here. And so they do something like the meditation walk, like breathing. And so those are the kinds of things we're inviting everyone to be aware of today. 
Tough day, feel bad, come back to the presence, stand on the earth to which we belong. So I know you remember, and some of you may be feeling in the bones right now, those ghastly hot days, those really horrible muggy days that hurt some of our bodies and some of our lungs and were hard on many, many of us. Remembering those days, I walked my dog Jimmy um, multiple times during those days, and we literally went from shade to shade to shade. And what we found was, you know, a tree that had dappled shade on the ground, and that's where we'd go. And it helped some. Sometimes we could go close to the trunk. There was more a deeper shade. And that's where we would be for a few moments till we went to the next spot and he actually got a walk in. And then because of where I live, there's a very narrow strip of unacculturated uh, trees, unmanicured, dead trees, live trees, bushes, all kinds of weeds, a very narrow strip of that. And we got closer to that and I felt the cool air kind of moving gently out from under the canopy of the trees and it restored me. Jimmy was drawn to it too, but it took a number of trees together. Single trees are awesome. A number of trees together, connected and wild and different, create a different kind of canopy, a restorative place. And it hit me when I was experiencing that, that the image of this congregation popped into my mind. Each one of us, if we're a tree or a bush, does what we can, what we must, in order to come back to ourselves, to revalue our lives, to bring energy into ourselves that is not toxic but loving. Each of us who does that is now part of a larger forest. It's important for us as individual beings to do that, but magnifying the capacity of our spiritual presence as a larger community is real, is real. As Adrian Rich says, to begin with the simple exercises first and slowly go on trying the hard one, practicing till strength and accuracy become one with the daring to leap into transcendence. I don't know if the poet Adrienne Rich was talking about death in that leap into transcendence or any moment in our lives when we become aware that we might choose to practice something to help us transcend a difficult moment not leave it but be present to it in a way that we shift my heart leapt standing near those beautiful woods and that air the quality that each individual tree together created that was restorative intentionally keeping in mind that we want to live our covenant and our values becomes the deep sheltering Democracy is at risk. Many of us working in our jobs struggle to maintain balance or have trouble finding it because it's so hard. People tend to be isolated and lonely and the exploitation of many people and our planet doesn't escape us. It is all there. It seems unstoppable. To live with love and hope and meaning, to value our lives, I need to practice what keeps me in alignment with what I say I believe. We can each benefit from deciding what practices will take us deeper into our connection to something greater than ourselves. You get to name that something, like love, connection to the universe, to our ancestors, nature, God, clear mind, Jesus, Buddha. There are many, many presences that we can choose to connect with to bring ourselves back. The toxic 
and painful dynamics of this time are powerfully deep and thoroughly embedded throughout the institutions of our culture. If I rely on momentum of the day, which I too often do, I then forget sometimes and get pulled into toxic dynamics that make it hard for me to live my values. And just in case you didn't notice, the pink sheet, there's one in every row, is our covenant together. At some point, you might want to look at it and think to yourself, is that something that could help me in my day to day to bring myself back to where I want to be? So if we practice, it may make it easier for us to be less often pulled into toxic dynamics. It may be potentially transformative when it's more possible even to connect. The clergy of the Interfaith Coalition of Greater Utica was invited to go to Rome, to be on the, Rome, New York, to be on the streets with people who are experiencing trauma from the tornado that struck there. And if you have not experienced what has happened in Rome, if you go, try with all your might to not be an observer. Try to get out of your car and go talk to somebody and say, what was that like for you? Because being observers of such tragedy, we kind of disconnect ourselves from, what, from belonging to what is most important to us. So try not to be just an observer. So I went as one of the clergy that was just gonna roam around. I knew I needed and wanted to go and I was afraid, I have to confess, because that much loss, that much trauma and rare feelings is hard to be around. I was afraid. So I called on my deceased mother, Pat, who in her life I saw many times quietly walk towards a trauma and be with a neighbor who, a neighbor who had lost a son, whose husband just walked out on her, who, whose teenager committed suicide, mom would just go there. She didn't fix a darn thing. She would just be present. So I decided, mom, I want you to be with me. And I remembered her. She, I felt her presence because I called on her. My ancestors, more than mom, were present for me as I went through and breathed in somehow a purposeful presence. I stood with a woman who's two weeks away from getting insurance for her house. She put her entire retirement savings into the house to fix it up and then get insurance. Half the house is now condemned and all of her savings gone. Every person I met along the way lost all of their food in the refrigerators. Some had lost their houses completely. Others had only recently lost a family member. A man stood there, you know, doing a good job of being resilient. He was really willing to show up for his neighbors. And as I just stood there and listened, he said, and my mama died three weeks ago. And I just said to him, that's so much loss. And he started to cry. And so it is just, you know, to just be present. I could not have been present if I had not cared for myself and brought something of my spiritual life into those interactions. I, in fact, was not out loud and not in a way that distracted me. Every once in a while, a snatch from Mary, uh, Holly, Mer Holly Near's song, I Am Willing, would come into my mind. I'm hopeful and I'm willing. To be hopeless would be so strange, it would dishonor those who came before us. So I lift myself up to the light of change. Many UUs over time have not been comfortable with the language of spirituality, and too many still think that spirituality and intellectual thought are somehow opposite, that they can't dwell together. They are not opposite, they dwell together in us. So what if 
we let go of the stereotype of somebody who's holy and who's peaceful and trans embodying transcendent. When I think of someone like that, I'm very grateful they can hold the form on all of our behalf. But if I use that as my model, I don't even try. It's too much. So what if we think about spiritual practice as a praxis? That we're practicing intentionally, knowing that it's not going to be perfect, we'll make mistakes, it's not going to be the right thing, it's going to fail. What if we learn something about, like our covenant, just a piece of the covenant, what if we learn that, or learn a line in a poem that moves us? I don't mean necessarily memorization, but something that, some words that touch your heart, a tune that when you think of it, it helps you breathe. Anything that helps you come back to where you feel most connected to learn more about that reflect on it and then act on it use it in a situation that might be challenging to you. And then step away from acting on it and reflect how did that go, what can I do again and practice it be intentional about about practice practicing it. What if we consider, for instance, that my engineer father was engaging in spiritual practice as he listed pros and cons to every decision. He would list every single thing he could think of in his pros to cons list, and he took the list seriously. And in the context of being a person who sometimes rigidly knew what was right, he knew what was the righteous, the most Christ-like thing to do would be. And he would list those pros and cons, and he would think, what would Jesus do? And then he would make his choice. Every decision he made, where's the family going on vacation? Pros and cons, you know. It, we got exhausted from him telling us, have you made your list of pros and cons? I still do it, I do. So. What if, for instance, like my mother, her praxis was simply love. She was an active lover. She would imitate what she understood to be the life of Jesus. If someone's hurting, I go there, is what she thought. And mom and dad were not shy about giving each other feedback about their praxis, that she would remind him of his rigidity and he would remind her of her passion which would sometimes find its way into a letter that she was writing that's and you know that sounded a bit self-righteous and so dad would say now pat and she was less um tactful when she interrupted him i'm sure um but what if my beloved deceased friend karen whose praxis was a daily meditation and counseling to stop the old, reactive, painful dynamics of her life. That was her purpose. And she worked hard at that daily and she brought it to other people she knew. She developed a spiritual muscle in herself to intentionally stop engaging in hurt. And instead she served love and healing and she practiced anti-racist behavior every day. How do each of us align ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, our souls, our actions with what we say we believe? That may be a way to describe spiritual practice, aligning ourselves, using a compass that you're choosing, using a compass to realign yourself with what you say your values, your highest values are. And get familiar with it and use it every day. Like me, if you want, you can have a whole tool chest full of those. They're all over my house, I wear them. In order to better align our thoughts and our emotions and ourselves, and most importantly, our actions with what we say we believe, we do have to practice and use this in some simple ways and use it in increasingly more difficult ways learn something about it act with it reflect on the action learn some more practice practice 
So what is your compass to return to who you want most to be as a person? And how do each of us and as a group return to covenantal interaction again and again? And I wonder if you have any thoughts that come to the surface for you. What, what can you use to practice coming back to who you say you want to be? What can you do? I know many of you use art. I know many of you talk to a particular person. What else? I know some of us pray. Some of us pray with our feet through activism. What else? I know you do it. You write. Yep. It's a beautiful way to see your thoughts and to pay attention to your thoughts. Writing. Gardening. Gardening. Yes. Yes. For many of us. Yes. Who else? Music. Absolutely. Yep. There are many and they do not have to and should all not all look alike. They should be as different as we are from one another. So now think about how the practice might be used to keep noticing racism, for instance. And when we notice it, to not look away, but to notice also how we are in relationship to that particular experience of racism. It is a painful thing to do, and too many of us are okay, really feel like we're doing well if we stop racist thoughts, if we would never dream of deliberately hurting a person of color. And systemic racism goes way beyond our individual intentions. So for us to become anti-racist or to really look at sexism, to really think about ableism, where our bodies work in different ways from each other, to really be present to that is painful. But if you have a practice that brings you back into your center and helps you remember who you are, what you belong to, you become more able to find a creative possibility. Or you just have different thoughts, and that's a beginning. Spiritual practice is intentionally using what brings you back to your deepest self to learn and act in new ways. The immediate goal is not to change the other person. It's to bring our best selves to difficult situations, to life as much as possible. Think about what Dr. Martin Luther King taught. Think about what Mahatma Gandhi taught. Values-based change is more likely to happen when we show up in this way. If we bring an awareness of our better selves, maybe not our best selves, but more of a possibility of connection to what we understand to be central in life, the greatest truth. Now think about a person you're currently having some trouble with. I'm not going to ask you to share. I'll just give you the opportunity to imagine if there's a tool that you can use to help yourself be present in the presence of that person. What might that tool be? What that compass might be like? That practice. It might not be a practice you use in front of that person, or it might. It might be breathing differently. Or it might be going away from that person and saying, I did not do any better that time. And then draw. Write. Talk to a dear friend. But to be intentional in our practice is valuable. It's worthy of our time. It is one of the few ways that we can address a world that is in trouble and is also extraordinarily beautiful and full of spirit and heart. It gets even harder when we think about ourselves um, 
interacting with individuals or whole groups of people who we have difficulty being near. And you all can come up with those ideas yourselves. And then remember our covenant. Remember our principles. Hold yourself accountable to how you think about, quote unquote, those people. I do not want us, I do not want myself to easily become on a daily basis a person who is very dismissive of a whole bunch of other people who's decided they're not worth my time or they're um, not savable. A lot of people do think that way on either side of the divide. So doing spiritual practice in community includes learning together how to live our covenant, which is on that pink sheet. It is a way of knowing how we intend to be with each other. And if you've got one by you, spread it around because there there's only one in each row. Just move it along so people can see. This is our covenant that was made by members of the congregation and agreed upon. So if we are familiar enough with our covenant to have someone in the room remember what our covenant says so that if something is said that seems hurtful that any one of us could at any moment say i'm my my heart hurts a little from our covenant being forgotten we don't have to accuse it it's better if we don't accuse anybody of anything but if we just raise the light raise the covenant lift our belief about how we want to be with each other we have a much better shot at being beloved community we have so much more opportunity to provide that deep restorative shade for each other and for a hurting world so use the covenant take it with you if you'd like there are more back there but this next year, we're going to keep finding ways to practice with our covenant, to just try imagining how we can use it when we're feeling despondent because of elections, because we're feeling disconnected from our, our own democracy, how we're feeling, you name it, close to death, unsure of our lives, any of those feelings. If we bring ourselves back to remembering our compass, using it, and we can help each other remember. Because if I don't remember, and I often forget, if I'm stuck or something else is going on, it was my dear friend who I lost who would say to me, um, have you um, written any of these things? You know, she would remind me that my intention was to practice. So you can ask someone to be your practice buddy. It's a very valuable thing to do, especially as things feel challenging. After coffee hour, I invite anyone who'd like to come and talk about this sermon in your, from your own experience. You're very welcome to do that. It'll be across the hallway. Bring your coffee and your snack. I'll be there. But what I wanted to get across is that it's not for someone else. What you choose to do doesn't have to look like anything anybody else does as long as it brings you to your truth and to what you say you believe about who we are and who we want to be together. Again, from Adrian Rich, we can begin with simple exercises first and slowly go on trying the hard one. Practicing till strength and accuracy become one with the daring to leap into transcendence. May that be so. There's a hymn on 1057 in the blue book called Go Lift It Up. Go Lift It Up. Please turn to that and when you're ready, rise in body or spirit or both.
please be seated. Thich Nhat Hanh saw a great deal of tragedy in his life. And he said that this was the thing that helped him on a regular basis. He would say, when life seems like a turbulent ocean, we have to remember we can have an island of peace inside. Life had ups and downs, coming and going, gain and loss. Dwelling in the island of self, one can be safe. So these are his meditation words. If you would join me in honoring this in him and in yourself. Breathing in, I go back to the island within myself. There are beautiful trees within the island. There are clear streams and water. There are birds, sunshine, and fresh air. Breathing out, I feel safe. I enjoy going back to my island. May it be so. Now's the time when beyond the many, many things people here do on behalf of this congregation and our community, it's time for us to collect the offertory that we are able to give for the enactment of our vision. Gratitude is a prayer. Just being thankful is a prayer. Gratitude rescues us from being lost. Gratitude for the generosity of each of us is the prayer in our hearts now as we dedicate these offerings to the fulfillment of our vision of a loving community. May it be so. And now Ken Drake is going to talk with us about another kind of generosity. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Drake, and I'm a member of the uh, UUU Democracy Action Task Force. After much deliberation, the members of the, this, t this task force realized that the aspirational beloved community, as envisioned by Dr. Martin Luther King, could form the basis of any promotional campaign we might develop to influence Americans to stop the hyper-partisanship hyper so prevalent today. We are working to formulate a message of inclusion to find the good in common that all Americans share. We will share our message with you in the very near future. To review, King called for elected officials, citizens, faith organizations, and nonprofits to address the problems facing humanity in a nonviolent way through reconciliation, redemption, and partnership. We here at UU Utica want to take a leadership role as we work with like-minded partners. The good news is that I am seeing the term beloved community in print and hearing it spoken more often. For example, a Catholic priest called for a beloved community during a webinar recently on systemic racism in America. The priest was critical of the way a certain candidate for president disparaged immigrants, referring to them as, to some of them as inhuman. My wife, uh, shared, who is a Presbyterian, shared uh, with me a prayer confession in the order of service uh, that she found during a, one of the recent Presbyterian services in Oneida. Forgive us, God, for the evils we perpetuate, the unjust systems from which we cannot see our way clear. Claim us and guide us in working toward the beloved community you so desire for us, where all your children live in peace. Amen. We invite you, the members of the team, and I, to join us in our commitment to the creation of such a beloved community. Thank you. The closing reading, the benediction, comes from Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, there's another truth, that you are not alone. And with that, I'll ask you to read the words to extinguish our chalice in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, but the warmth of community, our commitment, these we carry in our hearts until we meet again. find what you seek may your heart be at peace may your dreams never end may the road be your friend may you love may you stars all align may the sun always shine may your soul be your guide may god walk by your side may you love may you you seek may your heart be at peace may your dreams never end may the road be your friend may you love 